A Windows exploit bypasses a recent patch, ring doorbells are a surveillance state network, and malicious adware was found in hundreds of Google Play apps. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morris and this is ThreatWire for June 11, 2019, your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. It's time for a quick shout out. This one goes out to Jim, Clicker, Patrick, Jacob, Andy, Nicholas, and Bangdroid who joined the Patreon team this week. I would also like to say thank you to everyone who contributes to my content on alternative platforms over at snubsy.com support where you can go to support the show directly. And I'll put that link in the show notes and of course if you are interested in supporting ThreatWire on Patreon, as usual, hit up patreon.com slash ThreatWire. And make sure to stick around in this episode so you can find out how to win a Google Pixel 3a that I am giving away. And now, on to the news. Microsoft released a patch for vulnerability number CVE-2019-0841 in April, which allows users with lower admin privileges to steal files from the NT Authority System Directory by overriding a file's permissions, which allows for full control permissions for that user. The problem occurred because Windows App X deployment service does not handle hard links correctly. Now, I actually did a hack tip episode about hard links in Linux. That episode is called Hack Tip Linux Terminal 101, wildcards, hard links, and symbolic links if you want to check it out. Security researcher Nabil Ahmed found the vulnerability earlier this year, which Microsoft patched in April of 2019. Last week, though, a security researcher and exploit broker posted a zero date on GitHub for this vulnerability, which affects Windows 10 as well as Windows Server 2019. The user, they go by Sandbox Escaper, had previously published one other bypass for the same vulnerability, as well as several other other zero days for Windows patches. Her new one is a local privilege escalation vulnerability, so that means that it helps a hacker get access to files that are closed off due to usual admin privileges. It's called ByBear, and this one deletes Edge system files, crashing Edge, which thereby allows the bypass to impersonate system. According to Sandbox Escaper, this works for more than just Microsoft Edge as well. The GitHub publisher did not responsibly disclose these exploits to Microsoft, and the GitHub page has since been taken offline. However, that does not mean that the code may have been downloaded already by malicious actors, so patch your machines and set them up for automatic patching if you had not already done so. Sandbox Escaper wants to sell vulnerabilities for $60,000 a pop. Microsoft currently has active bug bounties in progress paying out up to $250,000. Microsoft's next Patch Tuesday drops today after recording this episode. Helpful Neighborhood Watch or Surveillance State Network Earlier this year, Ring, the Amazon-owned company that makes smart doorbells and cameras, posted a blog about their Neighbors app, which is used to upload fun videos from their home security technology. It's also used to report suspected crimes, such as people breaking into cars in the driveway of a home, stealing packages off the front porch, or wandering into the backyard and looking suspicious. Users have full control over which videos they choose to upload to the Neighbors app, and Ring says the company does not view or share videos not posted in the app without user consent, though Ring employees at their satellite office in Ukraine were able to watch videos through an administrative web portal just last year. Ring says this app is to create better and safer communities and their sole purpose is to quote, make safer neighborhoods for our families to live in. Police are also using this app to find criminals. Law enforcement can use the neighbor's app to see the same interface as users, but they can view all public posts within their jurisdiction and they can write their own posts as well. Law enforcement can also request videos from within a jurisdiction from Ring, which Ring then sends that request to the users. Users still have the right to not disclose video details to the police if they don't want to. Law enforcement could file a warrant for data, at which time they could gain access. Many are worried about how Ring is conducting business with police, though. Hampton, Virginia received 15 free Ring cameras after that jurisdiction partnered with the company. Others in Indiana, New Jersey, and California offer discounts of up to $125 off Ring cameras, with discounts coming from taxpayer funds, i.e. taxpayer money. Now, one city, Hammond, Indiana, received over $37,000 to subsidize Ring cameras. Half of that subsidy came from Ring, the other half came from the city. 
again, taxpayers. The idea of a discounted camera with a free service or one that costs as little as $3 per month to store the videos is enticing, especially from the opinion of protecting your home. Amazon's Ring is making that money back in droves whenever users sign up for the subscription service. Even if a discounted or free camera is not available, many users still hand over their footage of thefts or suspected crimes willingly to police, even without the application. But some of these jurisdictions are requiring end users to turn over any footage from said devices when requested, even though that is not in line with Ring's terms of service. And some of these townships are so covered with Ring devices that just stepping out of your front door would put you on video. So at one point, does a smart security system of cameras become a surveillance state? Since users are the first point of determination to opt to share videos, could you be considered guilty in the public eye even before proving it wrong if you were caught on video? Generally, law enforcement have to write a plan, they have to budget, get approval through the city government, and debate planned surveillance. And that's for surveillance that is just seen by the police, hopefully. In the case of Ring, if a user deems it so, anybody can see that footage. Police are able to use this footage with their own facial recognition technology or license plate readers to further find suspected criminals. Even if Ring faces published backlash for the consideration of adding facial recognition to their own devices, because they're a private company? Consider another vertical, that many of these videos are being used to advertise Ring doorbells and cameras on social media via paid posts. Ring uses videos of suspected criminals in sponsored posts aimed at specific neighborhoods. To catch a criminal? To sell their products? How about both? They don't anonymize the people on camera, so in the public eye, they are criminals. The user who recorded the video is in charge of consenting, not the police or the person caught on camera. So at what point does it become too much? While this is more of an opinion piece than news, I felt it worthy to share what's going on and raise some concerns. What do you think? Let me know down below. Before we hit story number three, I wanted to say thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. If you supported ThreatWire as well as TechThing, you probably saw the news two weeks ago that we are sunsetting TechThing and closing down that Patreon account this month. Nothing is changing for ThreatWire, but I did want to let you know that I am doing a huge giveaway over on my personal YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash Shannon Morse, just like my name. If you want to win one of these little guys, a Google Pixel 3a that I just smacked myself in the face with check out my smartphone camera versus episode on that channel just comment and subscribe to hear the winner announcement i'll be choosing a winner in about a week on that channel so definitely check it out if you want to win this little thingy and as usual thank you so much to my patreon crew and also a big thanks to my hush puppy perk level patrons for sending in their fur baby photos i love them keep them coming have you ever had an ad pop up on your Android phone seemingly out of nowhere days after installing any kind of new applications? Well, this news might be for you. 238 different applications with over 440 million installs on the Google Play Store were found to have malicious code cooked in that would push pop-up ads to Android phones at random, inopportune times. These included keyboards, emoji applications, themes and music and fitness apps, and a lot more. The apps all came from Shanghai, China-based Kutek, and the adware was called Buy to Ad, which would start throwing ads and showing ads anywhere between 24 hours to 14 days after installing one of their applications. The adware would force pop-ups called out-of-app ads, which could show up on the lock screen when a phone is asleep, or they could trigger audio and video playback. The adware was concealed in the 200 plus applications in the assets and components directory under the name beta.renc. This was later called Icon Icon Moon Gemini RENC and encrypted with a decryption key being obfuscated within the code. Now, because of the fact that all of the applications belong to Kutek and all had the same adware, security researchers believe the company knew what it was doing. Kutek, of course, denied this, saying that the adware was part of their monetization SDK. All applications were removed from the Google Play Store after discovery of the adware, but Kutek has not been banned. Infections occurred as early as seven months ago, maybe even more, and applications are listed in the links below on this show's description. And with that, do not forget to like and subscribe. I am Shannon Morse, and I will see you next time on the internet.